how specifically things like creatine actually enhance brain function. We, you can take this actually from both angles. This is like actual cognitive function. First of all, does it? Like if I take creatine right now, am I going to have an improvement in cognitive function? And then what about long-term brain as well? So kind of two-part question there mm -hmm. about creatine specific, I guess we'll just start there. Yeah. And then how actually it's, it's doing those, if it is at all. So whether you would see a significant benefit from creatine right now probably depends a little bit. Or you, you, you take your dose of 10 grams and like, what are you going to see? Uh, it probably depends a little bit on your context, but you, you probably saw the recent paper that showed that mm. after one night of sleep deprivation, you know, creatine can overcome some of those deficits. Cognitively. Um, cognitively. Yeah. And that's like, that was actually shown um, a few years ago uh, with uh, skill, uh, rugby skills in rugby players. You may have seen that paper as well, mm -hmm. where they had uh, players after a period of sleep deprivation, they gave them either creatine or caffeine and saw similar improvements in uh, like rugby specific skills compared to a placebo. Yeah, with a very different mechanism here, right? Yeah. You're talking about a stimulant and versus a fuel, right? Totally opposite. Yeah. So, uh, however, you could probably relate both of those to energetics in some way because caffeine is overcoming or it's inhibiting the metabolic down regulation caused by adenosine, um, which is part of what drives, you know, sleep pressure and the need for sleep as you accumulate uh, metabolites like adenosine, they then um, sort of suppress metabolic activity in the brain, um, which then is associated with reduced function. And something like caffeine overcomes that, whereas creatine can acutely uh, provide a buffer, uh, an energetic buffer that allows you to maintain function in the face of um, sort of increasing metabolic pressure to, to sleep. So even though different mechanisms, they kind of maybe converge on, on something similar. I know a lot of people who, you know, every time they take creatine, they notice like an immediate sort of boost of some kind really? of cognitive function. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about whether creatine negatively impacts sleep. Um, for that reason, it's sort of, it's slightly stimulating for some people. Mm -hmm. Um, I've certainly found that in myself. Like if I take creatine, I, I work out in the afternoon. If I take creatine after my workouts, I don't sleep as well. But if really? I take it first thing in the morning, it's fine because I've kind of separated it away and not everybody's like that. And certainly we know that, uh, responses to creatine are very heterogeneous, right? Some people see totally big, uh, big, uh, big responses. Some people see, see smaller responses and some of it's maybe related to, methylation status because creatine uh, when we make our own which we make a lot of is the most uh, methylation intensive process in the body you spend mo like more of your methyl groups producing creatine than anything else um and so it could be related to that as well as you know a, a whole host of uh, you know how much creatine do you normally have in your diet and and things like that how is creatine actually providing fuel for your brain um and then on the second part of that is well what's the normal fuel yeah. For our brain. When you think about uh, different energy systems, and I think people could uh, watch endless lectures from you talking about different <laughs> energy systems in, in, uh, in exercise, and those principles in some ways are very similar um, in the brain, although the majority of cells in the brain are, you know, like, like we said earlier, derived uh, derive energy from glucose, goes through glycolysis, then enters the electron, you know, the uh, pyruvate and, la and or lactase pyruvate goes into the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. But there's, all of that is done to generate high energy phosphates via usually or mainly ATP, right? So ATP is your energy currency. Uh, sort of a, a much shorter term um, energy currency or that allows you to recycle ATP when you've used it up is the phosphocreatine system. So um, your creatine is phosphorylated with a high energy phosphate and you use that to regenerate ATP. So for very energetically expensive uh, processes where you, you can't get enough energy through a, that longer process, the glycolysis and aerobic metabolism, then the buffer comes from the phosphocreatine system. And it seems that even for normal cognitive function, um, there is some benefit from having more of that buffer on board um, uh, both acutely and, and chronically. So just like your muscles yeah. or any other part of your system, they have to rely on energy. Mm -hmm. uh, the nerves need yeah. energy to conduct, yeah. right? And so people, I guess, sometimes don't always grasp the fact that your brain, when we say it's energetically demanding, it's because it's going through a ton of metabolism. Mm -hmm. 
we have this connotation that muscle and metabolism yeah. kind of thing. But the brain is metabolism <laughs> yeah. as well. Your basal metabolic rate, the amount of energy you burn throughout the day, your fast or slow metabolism, all these things are, it's in your brain yeah. as well. And so it produces energy much like anything else. It can use fat as a fuel source, theoretically. Mm -hmm. It can use carbohydrates. It could use ketones or anything else. And then creatine, uh, just like it is in your muscle, provides that stoichiometry of, of one to one, right? Yep. So not a lot of energy per molecule of creatine. So it gets used up and turned and burned quickly. But the upside is it gives you that energy really fast. Yep. And so while you're maybe slow to metabolize and you mentioned this, so we'll bring it up, your brain will actually then generate lactate. Yeah. So if you're thinking really hard and thinking a long time, are you <laughs> like feeling the burn in your brain? Is that lactate building up? Is that what's happening? I don't think... Uh... Lactate doesn't accumulate; it just gets generated and and used. You probably couldn't. Um, you you could you could probably measure. Um, so so this is where I, I think creatine becomes important. And and you know, potentially, if if I put microdialysis needles really you know accurately in certain parts of the brain, and then you you start to upregulate the use of that network for a specific function, because there's going to be a slight delay between increased ATP production. Um, and the requirement, right? You need you you actually need that energy before you realize you need it, right? Everything that we see and do has essentially already happened because of the time lag that it takes for us to actually interpret the those actions. So that energy is needed immediately, and it could be that because of the lag in the system, you know, upregulating uh, energy production, that's where creatine becomes important in yep. in in a network as you activate it. Then. You would probably start to see uh, locally if you could measure, you know, measure it with, uh, say, carbon thirteen metabolism or something. Like you could have a radio tracer on your on your lactate, and you could see that your astrocytes, which make your lactate for your neurons, um, will probably increase production because your neurons are more active in that area. They're going to require more energy. They've used up their phosphocreatine system, and then the astrocytes locally are going to produce more lactate. None of it's going to accumulate because it's getting used, but flux through the system is probably increasing. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode by clicking here.